Hi there, welcome to our webinar on solving the student loan crisis beyond debt relief. Uh, the seminar is uh, presented by the Shar School of Policy and Government Gender and Policy Center with support from IBM. To get us started, I'd like to introduce our Shar School Dean, Mark Roselle, who will then introduce uh, Mason's president, Greg Washington. Great, thank you, Bonnie. It's my honor to introduce George Mason University President Gregory Washington. A uh, little background about our president. Uh, Greg Washington became Mason's eighth president on July 1st, 2020. And he was the dean previously of the Henry Samueli School of Engineering at the University of California, Irvine. And then before that, uh, he was interim dean of the College of Engineering at the Ohio State University, where he had launched his academic career in 1995 as an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. He became an associate professor in 2000, full professor in 2004, and began serving as the college's associate dean for research in 2005, and also founded and led the university's Institute for Energy and the Environment. Uh, Dr. Washington impressively is the author of more than 160 technical publications in journals, edited compendia, and conference proceedings. He has conducted research for the National Science Foundation, NASA, General Motors, the Air Force Research Laboratory, and the US Army Research Office, among many others. He is a first generation college student and a New York City native who attended high school in North Carolina. Greg Washington earned his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees, all in mechanical engineering at North Carolina State University. So everyone, please welcome President Greg Washington. Greg. Well, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, Mark Rosell, for the, for the great comments. I am going to keep this brief. Uh, first of all, welcome to the panel. I want to thank you all for being here. The, uh, the Shar School always has these magnificent events, and I am sure that this one will not disappoint. Um, I also want to welcome any viewers around the country who are tuning in uh, to this event. Uh, it promises to be a great one. Um, look, COVID-19 has highlighted a real class divide. And, and, and the way you can look at this is of the 25 uh, percent uh, wage earners, uh, the 25 top, 25 percent top wage earners, more than 60 percent of them, actually 65 percent of them, were able to work from home and still get paid. And of the bottom 25 percent of wage earners, only about 10 percent of them were actually able to work from home. Um, and in the early days of the pandemic, the crisis uh, of, of this crisis. Um, only about 13% of people making over 100K were laid off or furloughed, and it was greater than 40% of people making less than 40K who were, who were actually laid off or furloughed. What does that have to do with the student loan crisis panel that we're talking about today? The primary and the largest differentiator uh, between wage earners is actually education. And the primary barrier for education for many across the country is actually the cost of it, which gets us directly to student loans. And so the, 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 the school here has assembled an impressive list of panelists to examine these issues. Uh, I look forward to hearing what many of you all will say. Uh, I will tell you at Mason, we're, we're trying to do our part in keeping student loans at a minimum. 66% of our students currently receive some financial aid. And we have a large number one of the highest in the state of students who are on Pell Grants and the like. And so it's very, very important to us to understand this topic and to look forward to solutions. So I am looking forward to what, what you all have to say. And I look forward uh, to a great and healthy conversation. So on that note, I'm going to step aside and uh, turn it over to the panel. Thanks so much, President Washington. And thanks, Dean Roselle, for setting the stage for our conversation. Um, thanks again also to IBM for their generous sponsorship of today's event. And, you know, we're really gratified that both George Mason University and the Shar School of Policy and Government provide a platform for these valuable conversations. And the Gender and Policy Center, and I know the school under President Washington's leadership as well, is, are dedicated to advancing equitable outcomes through policy. And 
We observe that in this crisis, as President Washington said, as in so many others, that adverse impacts are felt disproportionately by those who have been historically underrepresented and disadvantaged. And equity is a value intrinsic to the issue of student loan debt that any solution cannot fail to take into account. So spoiler alert, I don't think we're gonna actually solve the problem of student debt in the time that we have together today, but I do think that we've brought some great people to the table who have ideas about the size and shape of the problem and how it might be best addressed through policy and other means. Uh, so I'd like to briefly introduce our panel to get this collegial dialogue started and think about how we might move forward in mitigating this profound public problem. Um, as we get started, I want to give credit to Stacey Wisenant, um, the founder of Pay Your Tuition, and a member, I'm proud to say, of our Shar School Gender and Policy Board. Um, she provided the inspiration for this panel. Her company, PYT, provides students with the opportunity to utilize crowd giving and alter alternative data to reduce the burden of student loan debt. And um, she has over a decade of experience in finance and banking and is also a US Army veteran and former reservist. So we're pleased that we have the input from people like Stacy on our board to help us think about what issues we can address and bring in great people together to do that. So um, noting just a few of the many accolades of our panel, I wanna start by introducing um, Wilda Pilar is Vice President of Higher Education Policy and Practice at the Education Trust and former Deputy Secretary of Post-Secondary and Higher Education for Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf. Um, Casey Sachs is the Interim Vice Chancellor of Community and Technical College System of West Virginia and a former Deputy Assistant Secretary in the U.S. Department of Education. Wayne Johnson is former Chief Strategy and Transformation Officer and Chief Operating Officer for the Department of Education's Office of Federal Student Aid um, and a former Georgia US Senate candidate um, as well uh, with an interesting uh, policy position from the per uh, perspective of this panel. And finally, Claude Eusti is a Federal and Cognitive Analytics Partner at IBM and um, he's responsible for leading the Enterprise Cognitive Solutions function. So we'll address two rounds of questions in this panel, um, and then we'll take questions from the audience at the end as time permits. And the first thing we want to address is what's the size and shape of the problem? How did we get here? And most importantly, we want to give time to what preferred solutions, policies or otherwise are out there that our panelists can bring insights to. So uh, with that said, I'd like to start off with um, Will Del Pilar to um, give us a first kind of set the stage for um, the issue at hand as it confronts us. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate in this panel. Um, for me, it's, you know, it's an honor, but um, it's an honor to be here, but also to, to begin to try and address this challenge. You know, we know that a college degree has been the most reliable path to the middle class and the best protection against economic downturns as President Washington uh, alluded to, nine out of 10 new jobs go to those with the college degree. Um, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, nearly all new jobs created, um, and that they define those jobs as uh, those with benefits, such as retirement and medical care, went to people with some higher education. But we also know that while a college degree is, has never been more important, it's also never been more expensive. Uh, nationally, the purchasing power of Pell Grant is at its uh, lowest point in four decades. Uh, it covers less than a third of the full cost of attending a public education. And so we know that that has led to students and families uh, having to borrow more to attend college. Part of the issue is, uh, is due to state disinvestment in higher education. Uh, states have decreased their investment in higher education, and so the burden of the debt has been transferred on to students as fa and families. And as states have cut their funding, we know that the cost of college has uh, ex exploded. Um, average student debt for graduates of the class of 2018 was around $29,000. That's very different from state to state because states um, uh, invest differently, but the average debt was around $29,000. There are over 45 million uh, Americans that are dealing with uh, the weight of around $1.7 trillion and student debt, and about a third of that debt is held by 36, millions, 36 million Americans who started college and never finished. Uh, even though they re owe relatively small amounts, 
um, around $7,000 on average, these borrowers with debt and no degree are three times as likely to default on their loans as borrowers who completed a credential. While the issue of college affordability and student debt are important for everyone, there, you know, I would like to highlight that there is you know, a black student debt crisis in, in this country, and I think it deserves our collective attention. Half of black student borrowers who entered college in 2003, 2004 academic year defaulted on their loans within 12 years. Black borrowers from the highest income families are seven times as likely to default on their student loan as white student borrowers from the same income bracket. Um, we did a, a study at EdTrust. Um, we've done some work on black student debt and we found that and the borrowers in our study borrowed on average around $34,000. So they're borrowing more to go to college. Um, and when we talk to graduate folks who had graduate credentials, they borrowed on average over $100,000 to go to college. We know that standard repayment is around 10 years. Um, that's when the loan balance is supposed to drop to zero. But after 12 years with in interest accumulating, the average black student loan borrower borrows more than they initially took out to pay for college. So this compounds, I think, the challenge when we think about uh, this population of borrowers, uh, um, and some of these, some of the reasons for that are due to, you know, uh, uh, differences in wealth, uh, wealth gap, and inequalities in that space. And so we know that it's a, a challenge that needs to be addressed in some way, and we think that there are some policy solutions out there, and look forward to discussing. Them. Thanks, Will. Um, Casey, how about your perspective on the size and shape of the? So problem? nice to see everybody. <laughs> Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. So, I mean, Will lays this out really well. And one of the things I actually appreciate this panel is that no one is calling um, student loans a crisis, because I would actually argue that student loans aren't a crisis, but there are definitely things about them that are very problematic. Um, people are borrowing money for something that they want, and our country's interested in backing that investment with federal funds because we recognize there's a societal benefit to having healthcare workers and police officers and thousands of other roles across the country. So the premise of the loan is that it's going to be paid back, but we have some real issues with um, loan repayment mechanisms and, and the fact that the whole system is really complicated. So we have, for simplicity's sake, we have two big issues when we talk about student loans. There's undergraduate loans and graduate school loans. So about 40% of the loan portfolio belongs to the graduate student debt camp, and it's higher in absolute amounts. So when you hear about borrowers who are borrowing $200,000, when you get into that data, it's often for something like dental school. So it starts making some more sense that it would be such an absolute higher amount of money. But Will really nailed this one. With undergraduate loans, we worry about those because um, while it might be a smaller amount of money, we're seeing you know, students default with a $7,000 loan, we're seeing higher default rates and we're really concerned about students who leave school with no degree because they're not seeing the labor market benefits that we see for people who have completed their higher education. So for the audience who's sort of not immersed in the student loan space, we have something that's called income driven repayment plans and we call them IDR plans that offer loan forgiveness, but they offer loan forgiveness after 20 or 25 years of eligible payments. So Congress created the IDR repayment program in 2007. So we haven't even had a full 20 years to see what the impacts are going to look like. Um, so that was backed in President George W. Bush's administration um, to make student loan payments more manageable. And then we saw the Obama administration really expand the program. So the way those work is we see monthly payments capped at 10 or 15% of borrowers discretionary incomes under some of the more popular IDR plans. Um, and then borrowers who have not paid off their loans within 20 or 25 years can have their outstanding balances forgiven. So it's, um, it's a good program to think about how do we help people eliminate that debt after a period of time of demonstrating that they're paying it back. But there's definitely some issues when we start getting into, you know, how would we fix these problems. Um, and then we also see, and I think Will did a great job diving into this too, the increases in debt from school has some really big equity implications, both for women and for black students in particular. The implications from my perspective are as much about society as they are about school. And the reason I say that is when you look at black students, for example, they're more likely to take out loans for college because their families generally have less intergenerational wealth. 
And for women, we see gender-based pay gaps in all fields. So men in the same fields as women earn more effectively taking women longer to pay back the same loans, um, which has implications for the cost over the life of the loan. So we actually, something that gives me hope and that I'm kind of excited about, the federal government has, uh, has published program level outcomes related to student loans um, and expected wages after completion of degrees. So this is, the reason I'm excited is because um, we see several technical degrees hitting above their weight category, if you will, and several grad, graduate degrees that really are very concerning. You see a um, $100,000 degree where people are taking out $100,000 in loans for an expected return of $50,000 a year. And so just the ratio is really off. Um, if you're interested in this particular area, Georgetown Center on Education and the Workforce has done some great analysis. Uh, they really demonstrate that not all bachelor's degrees are worth the same amount at graduation. Health majors, for example, are nearly a third more at entry level than students who study in the liberal arts. Um, so, I mean, I, I see a lot of possible solutions and I'm excited to talk about those with you today and um, probably a decent overview. All right, thanks. Okay. Um, Wayne, why don't you give us your perspective? Sure. And Bonnie, just for uh, <clears throat> clarification, would you restate the, the question that you're wanting to have addressed at this point? Yes, at this point, we just want to understand from your perspective, some definitional distinctions about the problem of student loans. I mean, I actually do think um, we did call it a crisis in the <laughs> in our, um, our promo event promos. And that's a whole other rhetorical discussion. But yeah, what's the size or shape of the problem or crisis or dilemma, however we want to characterize it. Um, so how, what would you say are the most important attributes of that problem? Well, I actually have a different term for it, and I call it an abomination. I think it is a uh, abomination that's hiding in plain sight. I am uh, pleased to see a couple of my former colleagues uh, on the panel. Hi, Casey, and great to see you landed, and the perfect job for you, and uh, your state's well served by your uh, inclusion there. Uh, from a background standpoint, you know, I come out of the financial services world, you know, credit cards, <clears throat> visa, that kind of stuff. And then I went and got a doctorate in higher education. My focus was on understanding student loan debt. That's what I wrote my uh, doctoral dissertation and did my research on. And at that point in time, I found that there were problematic issues, primarily with people understanding the, the nature of the loans that they were getting into. And I do still think that that's a, uh, a major issue that people do not even understand when they're at the school that they're actually signing up for these types of loan obligations. And they certainly don't understand uh, the, the, uh, the depth and breadth and complexity of the loans. But when I took over as the head of uh, the Office of Federal Student Aid, and so to speak, the buck stopped with me. And again, I brought Stacy on board at that time to, um, and I, I said, you can affect the lives of millions of people. Uh, let's get on with it. Uh, what I really came to find out is that uh, there are so many flaws with the laws and so many flaws with the policy administration or the practice administration uh, that is, it, it, you could spend hours upon hours and in, in, in an eternity admiring this problem. And it is a problem, it is a crisis, it is an abomination. Uh, the, the idea that we would have an unlimited amount of money uh, being made available to students either by way of their undergraduate direct borrowings or their, their unlimited grad plus borrowings or their parent plus borrowings uh, to match up with whatever pricing schools want to set uh, basically is a condition for lack of total cost control at the university level. And I'm sure that, you know, a lot of presidents of colleges will tell me I just don't understand uh, cost. But what I do understand is that um, Cost have a way of matching up to whatever money is available and ergo, you know, there's very little uh, constraint on that. Um, when I say an abomination, let me give you an example. I happen to know in the file, there are uh, some grandmothers uh, that owe over a million dollars in student loan debt. And they took these on as parent plus loans uh, for multiple grandchildren. And most of these situations were, um, you know, first generation uh, college goers, there were, you know, disadvantaged, uh, economically disadvantaged folks, uh, certainly folks of color, who sought that um, getting the education was going to be the stepping stone to attaining the American dream of uh, progression. 
but those same grandmothers today are having their social security checks uh, garnished. Uh, they're having their student loan debt uh, with interest compounding upon compounding. And, and you know, they're, they're living a lifetime of, of debt burden. Another major problem uh, is the, everybody talks about the wonders of the income driven repayment plan, IDR. Uh, IDR is fantastic in the sense that it will lower your monthly out payment payment outflow up obligation. It is horrendous because it is destroying your credit bureau report. Because what happens is those loans are, are suffering negative amortization. And so that loan that started off at being $40,000 or $29,000, I heard somebody mention, after a few years, it's going to be $100,000. And your credit bureau is going to be constantly reflecting this ever-increasing uh, balance. And when the mortgage companies look at your credit bureau, to see whether you qualify for a mortgage, they make an automatic assumption that 1% of that outstanding balance is what your payment obligation is, even though it's only $100. So there are secondary and tertiary implications to these things. So the net net of it, it is a crisis. It is an abomination. Uh, this idea of creating funding available to satisfy or meet a, a public good is, is um, has just become this unbelievable monster that cannot be tamed in its current uh, vein or fashion. I mean, I was charged with the responsibility of making everything work smoother and better. And I will tell you, we can put money out at the Department of Ed like nobody's business. It will go out the door, you know, you know, as slick as it can possibly be. But we also don't happen to know for two weeks who it went to. And that's the reason you have $6 billion, $6 billion of in, improper payments each year because the, the schools can draw down uh, the money without actually having an earmark for a student. And then we have this incredible trap of everybody thinks this money is going for tuition and uh, books. Uh, I cannot even begin to tell you how many tattoos and spring break parties have been paid for with student loan debt because the money comes in and the, there's no real control over, there's an actual matching of the money to the actual uh, educational obligation that you know people sign up for. So anytime you can have somebody sign a 10-year promissory note, the school can cause any amount of money to be drawn against that as long as it meets within the um, you know cost to attend limitations. And then you can compound that with parent plus loans and grad plus loans, you got a problem. Thanks for your perspective, Wayne. I, yeah, as someone who teaches program evaluation is familiar with some of these, it sounds like some of the issues of transparency and accountability um, in program implementation sound like need addressing in that regard. But let's move to Claude and um, hear your perspective um, from, from uh, where you sit. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. It's uh, a lot of really uh, interesting and thoughtful opinions. What I would add is this, the way, the way IBM has been perceiving this is our workforce is going through this process of acquiring this education that you've all been talking about. And when we think about the people that we bring in, uh, we see many candidates that challenge, are challenged getting that education. Uh, it is a complex process as has been described. Uh, many people who enter the system don't know how to measure what they're about to sign up for. Uh, they don't know how to manage the steps that they go through. It isn't necessarily enroll at a four-year school and graduate four years later. Uh, you could begin at a community college, transfer several times, and then finally get a degree. And along the process, you have the friction of trying to transfer your credit hours. And if you have to retake a course, you incur debt. Uh, all of these things we believe could be made uh, less uh, difficult to navigate and I think some folks in society that come from a family that's more affluent, that has a history of college graduates, they understand how to navigate that system. They've been through it themselves personally. Uh, but we need to instrument it, uh, for want of a better term. We need to put a way that everyone who's going into the process of acquiring an education understands their options. And whether that means it leads to the traditional four-year program, or perhaps they start earlier with an accelerated program at the high school level, or they go into an apprenticeship program that could then lead to an education with a four-year degree. There are many options, and those give you much more flexibility on the cost you incur and when you can become uh, ready to earn income providing uh, those skills. So we're interested in multiple pathways. 
And we're interested in seeing how the educational system can inform someone about the cost of the options and which one might be best suited for them. Thanks, Claude. Yeah, I think it's a good illustration of how private sector partners can really help bring solutions to the problems that bedevil us. And um, so I, I'm thankful for all your opening remarks. Um, I, I think they raised some interesting points. Um, and I just wanted to say that one of the points is some of the questions that face us are, you know, what should we be doing? What do we value as a society? So should we be providing, you know, is education a public good, right? So I think there's a strong argument from my point of view that, that, that it is. And, you know, how do we do it and are we doing it well is another question, right? There's, there's, there's value of policy and there's implementation questions. So that's one, um, one issue. And then what Casey raised about, you know, the value of different types of education, I, I think is a point just for us to keep in our minds. Yes, it's true that you know some humanities will yield less earnings in later years, but I think the problem is wider than that. And I'm sure Casey um, can speak to this as well, perhaps. Um, but I know that medical school and law school, all professional level education also incurs wild amounts of debt that often can't be repaid and also create further class divisions. Um, so that's a, another aspect of the problem. Again, as I was saying, like from, from the perspective of the Gender and Policy Center, we're really interested in these questions of equity as well as um, you know, the mechanistic questions of how things might be carried out by any given policy. Um, but now that we turn to solutions, that's what we'll be talking about, sort of the solutions um, of, of the problem um, and its disproportionate uh, impacts across society. So Will, I will take back up with you to address um, that aspect of it, favored policy solutions and um, what you think we can, can do realistically. Well, I think in this space, there is, really is no silver bullet. Um, there isn't one thing we need to be approaching in terms of policy. And if we think there is, then I think we're just going to create other issues for ourselves by trying to implement a single policy solution. So from my perspective, I think that you know the, the policy solutions need to uh, be more comprehensive. Uh, we need to, you know, I think that there should be some level of student debt cancellation. I think it should be targeted um, towards those individuals with the lowest wealth. Uh, instead of blanket cancellation, which there has, have been you know, proposals uh, for $10,000 blanket cancellation from the Biden administration. There's uh, a bill in, from the Senate uh, and some proposals from the Senate to, um, for $50,000 of, uh, of blanket cancellation. But I do think that their debt cancellation needs to be a part of the solution. Um, in addition to that, we need to address uh, you know, the issue of affordability. And I think the way we do that is through doubling the Pell Grant. Um, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, the decreasing value of Pell in, you know, the 1970s, it, co it covered around 28 or 70, around 78% of the cost of public uh, higher education, and today it's less than 28%. Uh, and so uh, with, you know, the decreasing value of Pell, we need to reinvest in that program. In addition to that, I think that, you know, we need to hold states accountable, the fact that there are such different levels of, uh, of investment in different states, uh, I think is really problematic. So, you know, as an example, you know, I'm originally from California. If I were to take a class at a community college, it cost me around $180 to take a three credit class. That same class in Pennsylvania, would cost me over $1,800. And part of that is because states invest very differently uh, in higher education. So I do think a federal state partnership that requires some level of state investment in order to get federal funds and tie that back to, you know, that to affordability for students is something we need to, to really consider. And then, you know, I'd say the last thing is we need to address accountability in higher education. Um, currently, there's very little mechanisms by which to hold institutions accountable, uh, especially institutions that may burden students with um, copious amounts of debt. And uh, as Casey alluded to, offer a degree that may not have any value in the, in the marketplace. And so, um, you know, institutions are, you know, I, and I ask students and other folks, do you know what the minimum graduation rate is for colleges to be able to award Title IV aid? Uh, you know, no one knows because there isn't one. You can graduate 11% of your students and still continue to give students student loans or graduate none of them as long as those students don't have a, a high cohort default rate. And so I do think we need to address accountability in higher education. I think, you know, should the um, Higher Ed Act become reauthorized in the next couple of years, it's 12 years, 13 years overdue. 
I think it is something that we need to really take up and address accountability, not only for the for-profits, I think for um, the higher ed space generally. So those are some solutions I think we need to be exploring. Yes, thank you, Will. Yeah, we when Stacy and I first talked about doing this panel, that's we talked about debt relief because that's sort of the hot topic on the minds of everybody in the press right now, you know, and that of course that has has resonance. Um, and I, you know, think I agree with you uh, that it should be part of the solution. But Stacy was adamant that we wanted to look beyond that. And you know, with every policy issue, we see that we have the real time problem. Like, what do we do to um, address the most acute pain from the problem, and then what do we do long term to prevent it occurring again, or you know, to um, deal with the long term aspects? So you've brought forth a number of solutions that sort of do both of those things. So I appreciate that, um, Casey. What are your uh, solutions? Well, I think Congress should just let Will and me rewrite the Higher Education Act because together we could come up with some really interesting policy solutions. Um, I think. One of the things that Will said that really resonated with me is that there is not a silver bullet to solving these problems. And so I'll offer four or five things that could be part of a solution, but don't want to give anybody the impression that doing any one of these would completely fix our student loan problems. Um, we could change the structure of how we offer loans. We could do program-based loans. It would be really simple to do actuarial tables at the program level and lend more to programs that have a greater expectation that those loans could be repaid and then create incentives for states to identify where they have the greatest labor market needs and get states to subsidize the programs that they identify are needed in their states. So we're actually seeing that both in Arkansas and in West Virginia with free community college programs that it's not universally free community college programs, but certain certain programs with not like not all community college is free but programs within the community colleges are because both of those states have said, this is where the labor market need is. And so this is what we're going to subsidize. Um, certainly part of the state authorization process could involve states closing programs that produce more debt than their graduates could reasonably pay off. And I think that's a real compliment to what Will's saying is what's the standard for how many graduates should you reasonably produce from a, a cohort of students who are taking out loans? What should our expectations be in lending lending this money to colleges to continue to operate. Um, instead of our current cost of attendance models, we could do caps on the amount that could be borrowed. I would personally get rid of the Parent PLUS loan. I think it's a terrible idea, um, but I know that there's a whole contingent of folks who would argue with me about that one. Um, debt cancellation sounds really good for politicians to get reelected, re but I certainly question the value as a universal policy. There's a good working paper out of the University of Chicago right now that demonstrates that widespread debt cancellation primarily helps higher income borrowers. Um, and, while, and when we have the IDR programs that forgive balances after 20 years anyway, it sort of begs the question about why debt cancellation for everyone is such a good idea. Um, it sort of feels like using a mallet on a problem that we should be solving with a scalpel that what if we had automatic eligibility at the end of an IDR term instead of requiring students to apply for forgiveness? What if we had a provision that said it didn't affect students' credit scores? Um, there's just different things that we could do that could make the program that exists more effective rather than saying, this is a silly program and we don't want it at all. It's a great way to handle student loan cancellation, um, but with a little bit more intentionality. And frankly, we have the technology to easily track these things and to act on them. So it seems like we should be really leveraging that technology and moving forward. And then there's a lot of pieces of student aid eligibility um, that don't sound like they initially contribute to student debt, but they really do. So one that I'll just highlight for you all is the definition of a full-time student. Federal aid uses 12 credit hours as the standard for full-time, but it is impossible to create a, to complete a bachelor's degree taking only 12 credit hours each semester. 15 credit hours each semester is really full time if you have any expectation of completing a four year degree in four years. And one, we've seen a number of states do some really good work in this area doing uh, 15 to finish campaigns. Like if you could look at Hawaii as a really good example, they've proven that low income students can be just as successful taking 15 credit hours as taking 12 credit hours, but they found that their colleges needed to make some changes to ac accommodate student schedules. The colleges really were responsive. So this matters when we're talking about loans because taking out a loan for a full-time course load doesn't change the loan amount, whether it's 12 credits or 15 credits, it's the same loan amount. But if you only enroll in 12 credits, 
then the federal government's essentially set you up to need to enroll in a fifth year of college on a four-year degree, which essentially would make your degree cost 20% more. Okay, thanks, Casey. Those are some good, solid uh, specific <laughs> solutions to contemplate. Um, Wayne, I know you have lots of ideas. <laughs> well, well, first of all, I think we all need to realize that um, almost all of the debt on the books is uh, going to be forgiven in one form or another. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, time and it is a matter of fact. Um, when you look at an IDR, that's a, eventually a back-end grant. When you look at um, uh, some of the other programs, they're, they're all engineered to eventual uh, uh, you know, debt relief. Uh, but there are very painful uh, experiences while you're waiting to get from where you are to now till then. Uh, the other thing people really need to appreciate, and I, I, I had a chance to talk to several uh, United States senators and Congress people when I was running for the Senate, and one of the pieces of information that I shared with them that was an aha moment is every penny of this $1.7 trillion is already part of the national debt. Uh, so we could, uh, with the stroke of a pen, eliminate every bit of the current student loan debt and not have to raise another dime in order to uh, fund it, it's already funded. Um, I happen to know that about 75% of all the dollars in file that are paying as agreed um, because of the nature of the, uh, let's call it the, uh, you could be paying as agreed, but be paying a dollar, uh, is never gonna get repaid anyway. So the American public believing uh, through the representation and the Office of Management Budget that these dollars are in fact going to come back is, is just a fallacy. Right now, uh, we put out $130 billion a year, more or less. Uh, we collect back about $45 billion a year. Now, the notion that you would try and uh, take the money and, and so to speak, budget it and give it to the quote, most needy uh, makes no sense at all because this is not an affordability issue for the government. The government has the money and so uh, debt cancellation or uh, debt elimination uh, at the government level needs to go across uh, to everybody. And we could get into all kinds of philosophical arguments, but um, you could satisfy all the needy and, uh, and all the quote, unneedy, uh, and it won't take a dime away from the quote, the needy in the process. Uh, but, and I, I think we also need to realize and recognize uh, debt cancellation of a level is going to happen and it is going to happen within the next 12 months. Uh, the only question is what is the amount going to be? Uh, is it gonna be $10,000, which is pretty much the prevailing uh, determination, I mean, idea right now, is it gonna be a higher amount? Uh, and then the real question that's batting about is can that be done through administrative actions? Can it be done through executive order? Uh, and the questions they're being asked is, first of all, can you allow bankrupts, uh, the student loan to be discharged through bankruptcy through administrative action? And the answer is yes. All you have to do is decide not to challenge bankruptcy. So that's one aspect of debt cancellation or debt forgiveness that can, can come down. Uh, the next one is, can you suspend interest payments? And the answer is during a crisis, you can, but you can't do that by law, in my opinion, from my understanding forever. And then can you actually cancel uh, large amounts of debt uh, by executive action? The answer is most probably not, but the re reality is who, who will come forward to challenge it. So it's going to happen. And the sad part about it, it's going to happen without uh, any, um, quid pro quo, anything in exchange for that. Uh, one of the things that I have advanced is that for every $1,000 of debt that is canceled, and in the future, every $1,000 of grant money that's given, uh, I'd like to see 10 hours of public service, 10 hours of community service, 10 hours of apprenticeship training, something in exchange for that uh, wholesale uh, canceling of debt. Uh, what do I think? I think the entire student loan program should be ended it should be stopped in its tracks. Uh, we should never make another dollar of, um, of loan money available through the federal uh, government. But what we should do instead is give um, what I call Opportunity Plus grants. And my advocacy is that for every, every student that graduates from high school should have $50,000 to go attend school. And if you're below a certain, socio, socio, I mean, below a certain economic level, 
uh, you should have a supplemental $35,000 and or if you're going into science, technology, education, engineering, and math, you could also have that supplemental $35,000. So my belief is that between fifty dollars and $85,000 of funding should be available to every single American graduated from high school in order to go pursue a uh, undergraduate ab uh, education. And that I believe is uh, fulfilling a public good mission. When you start talking about graduate student loans, you start getting a little bit in the field of, of, of you know, private goods more so than public goods. And I think those programs should be set up with federal income sharing arrangements, but I don't think they should have any interest charged on those federal income sharing arrangements and they should be capped. So to summarize, uh, your your title of today I thought was dead on. What do you do beyond debt, uh, you know, debt relief? And the answer is you shouldn't give a penny of debt relief until you know what you're going to do day two after you've done the cancellation. However, we are going to find ourselves with uh, ten thousand dollars. I'm pretty sure of it. And in, in light of some of the conversations I've been having over the past couple of weeks. Question is going to be, is it going to have to pass Congress or not? And if it goes to Congress, I think it will be passed. It will not be uh, coupled with what happens after debt relief. Uh, that's going to be continuing to be the question. And that's the reason uh, any larger amounts of debt uh, will not be conducted until Congress comes to grip with what do you do after student loan debt relief. So to summarize, get rid of the, of the loan program put out uh, large, uh, uh, basically Opportunity Plus grants, couple those with enhanced Pell grants and, and STEAM uh, grants. And uh, let's ask everybody to give us 10 hours of public service for every uh, $1,000 of debt money that's canceled or uh, grant money that's extended. Thanks, Wayne. Um, Claude. Well, Probably I wouldn't focus as much on policy as your other guests, but let me just offer a couple of thoughts. Um, our experience, one, uh, this is about people embarking on a lifelong learning path. Uh, it's incredibly frequent that someone obtains a degree, but a few years later, they're doing a different kind of work and they're having to retrain themselves and learn how to move their career forward, their job forward, doing something different, either because the economy changes or some factor affects them. And it's a wealth journey also, right? People need to be able to manage education as part of their wealth, just like they would their retirement savings. So I think part of it needs to evolve from being a loan that you incurred in order to get a degree to considering in the long term, where will this lead you to and how do you plan for it? And the, all the guests have articulated enormous amounts of information and decision-making opportunities that are out there. And I think we need to simplify those. And we need to provide the information in a way that's consumable by people that frankly don't have that expertise, that could understand what it means uh, with the full understanding that, you know, to your earlier comment, uh, for example, I'm an electrical engineer. I don't do electrical engineering work. I haven't done electrical engineering work for a couple of decades. Uh, I retrained in healthcare administration, and I went and worked in that area for a time. Uh, that's part of your journey. That's where you're going to also incur costs. So it's not a one time and you're done. How do I fix that and move on? I think we want to help people become these lifelong learners, plan financially for that, that they can continue to develop over time. And then how do we accommodate giving them the information, the decision-making power, to plan those journeys effectively. Well, thank you all for contributing your insights and we, we need a lot more than an hour to discuss them, <laughs> but I am gonna move on. I wanna um, take a question or two from the audience and then we'll return to some of the points that you made. Um, I particularly liked Wayne, your point about uh, public service, you know, some form of public service, uh, but we'll, I hopefully we'll get a chance to touch upon that. Um, one, of, uh, one of our students wants to know um, and what tips you have for people to minimize graduate school debt in the current system that we have, you know, <laughs> given that we are here, uh, what do you tell somebody who's in the midst of this waiting to see what's going to happen? Don't take all the money that they offer you. you That's you, a good one. <laughs> uh, you, they will load you up with money. Uh, decide exactly what you need uh, to have. 
And uh, when you do get the money, don't go spend it frivolously because you can always do an advance repayment against the loan. But uh, if you're in grad school, you can pull down a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, one of the bizarrest examples I saw were grad schools that would have somebody borrow 150,000. The grad school would keep 50,000 and they would give the student a $100,000 stipend. Uh, and the student basically borrowed 150,000 a hundred thousand of which they use for their own living expenses. I mean, how crazy can you get in that regard? So there are people that are gaming this system uh, uh, just for you know a, a form of of having uh, you know living cash flow, not just for the purpose of education. I tell students who I work with to pick funded graduate programs. So Wayne makes a great point. Don't take out everything that they'll give you in loans. But when you're selecting your graduate program, choose a place that'll give you a research assistant position, a teaching assistant position. There are lots of graduate programs where you can find housing on campus. Um, I know when I did my doctorate, I was a house mom in a sorority. So look for those kinds of opportunities so that you don't have the same kinds of living expenses because it's not unreasonable to take out a loan to be able to cover the cost of living. But um, I do think Wayne makes a good point that $100,000 seems uh, a little bit excessive. Um, and so certainly to think about where you're matriculating. And so, you know, if you're in Bowling Green, Ohio, that's going to cost a lot less than if you're in Boston um, and making choices about where you're going to graduate school and the kinds of opportunities that are available to you as a student um, should really inform your matriculation choices. And I would also say I'd love for it to Claude and IBM to come up with a uh, AI capability that would help you to walk you through where you want to wind up and what's the best way to get there using some, you know, decision. I don't even know how AI works, but assume it's some level of decision tree involvement. Uh, but there's more money than you need. Don't take down all the money that's offered. Are any of you, I mean, we have a, an interesting question that I don't think we are the panel with the expertise to answer that much, but it's about whether or not what uh, other countries are doing. Do we have any insights gleaned from international comparative I, I, situations. I've been a great, I have another business before I joined the department called International Education Partners. And uh, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work. I'll give you the example of Brazil. Uh, Brazil charges corp, their corporations 1% of their top line revenue. And they use that to fund their entire education system, their K-12 through uh, higher ed. There's zero cost to go to college. Uh, but you have to pay for your own living. They don't have the climbing walls and the uh, and the and, you know the, the the tubing cities and the uh, what have you. They're just good old fashioned. You go to school and they're some of the top ranked schools in the world. Um, and um, and and the same thing in Costa Rica. So around the world, uh, this 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 phenomena that we have of of people taking down personal loans in order to pursue education is truly a unique phenomena. And um, um, so, so, so that's, you know, that's, that's, you know, one of the things that I would say is, uh, you know, this, we're, our, our higher education system is basically state driven as opposed to federal driven. Other countries, their higher education systems, except for some of their high, high, high level privates, are all federally driven. And um, that's, that's a big difference. I think I would also offer maybe look at Switzerland and Germany and yeah. their apprenticeship mm -hmm. models. You know, Claude early on talked about apprenticeship as a way to think about um, getting access to different career areas. I know I've hosted several exchange students and one of my former kids is in Germany and she's in her first year of an apprenticeship with Deloitte. And so she wants to be an accountant. And so she's studying accountancy, working with a firm that puts her to work three days a week and she's in class two days a week but it's very normal. It's very, it's very much a part of the culture and a part of the system. We have some incredible apprenticeships here in the United States, but the bulk of our apprenticeships, um, we don't see them in areas like banking. We don't see them as for accountants. And so to really expand those programs into other industry areas would be a huge benefit to our students. To give you an example, Brazil, uh, yes, they charge this money for corporations, but they also allow the corporations to actually educate, uh, uh, set up educational uh, capability. So Bradesco, for example, has Bradesco University. Uh, they have about 250,000 employees, but they also have 
at any point in time about 40,000 people attending Bredesco University. Bredesco University is funded by the federal government. If you attend Bredesco University, you're guaranteed a job at Bredesco when you graduate, but you're not obligated uh, to work for Bredesco. You can go work for any other bank. So uh, this is a situation where you have a uh, private uh, private university executed by a bank, funded by the federal government, uh, tied into an apprentice program and doing, uh, you know, ba basically cross-market uh, training. So there's some really interesting uh, intersections that can occur between education and uh, corporate America. At the end of the day, why do we go to school? We go to school to learn, but we also go to school to get a credential signal. For the, you know, here's the signal. You got to this degree, therefore you're qualified. Uh, you know, corporations are the ones that set up what the, you know, the re requisite, uh, uh, you know, requirements are, or you can't get through the HR process. Um, you know, I, I'm a big proponent that I think everybody should edu be educated, and then uh, if they pass, then they can pay the money to get the signaling credential. So, you know, if I go to a restaurant, I kind of like to pay after I've had the meal, as opposed to before I sit down. And uh, we pay for the, ex the process experience in the United States. We don't pay as, an, as a consumer for the outcome. I, I was just gonna say that Washington, the state of Washington actually does something similar to what Wayne is describing. They've created a tax and that's effectively how on businesses and that's effectively how they pay for their free college program uh, in Washington state. I would also say there's models like Australia um, where there's a, percentage of your income you pay back, and let's say it's 10% for 10 years, um, regardless of what you make, and that's the way they fund higher education. So there are other models for it. Um, and we have actually some different models, even you know here in the United States, like Washington, which is doing something similar to what Brazil is doing. You know, private industry has a strong incentive along the lines of which we've all described. Uh, the biggest expense is recruit and retain. And when you're competing in the open market for people with the strongest credentials, it takes a lot of cost to recruit and you aren't necessarily going to retain. Uh, if you've invested with someone and they've gone through an apprenticeship, they've learned, they've worked. And as was said earlier, right? It's more than a credential and it's relationships in the industry. You're more likely to keep that person as an employee longer. That's worth an enormous amount of money versus now that they're very competent, they leave and they're working for someone else, possibly a competitor of yours, and you're going to start over again. So there's mutual interest in having something where we say we invest in each other to get to that ability to, uh, uh, to build a stronger workforce. I would also make another comment. Everybody needs to understand uh, from a credentialing standpoint, it doesn't matter where you start, it matters where you finish. But from a cost and value of education, there's a lot to be said with starting at community college level and getting your, so to speak, getting your, you know, you know, earning your spurs. And, you know, I would highly encourage everybody to get a, uh, a skill associated with a, uh, uh, you know, let's say an, a, an academic uh, type um, capability as well. And so Casey, I always love y'all's area of the world. Well, I'm pleased to say that George Mason has a, an agreement with uh, the community college system in, in the Commonwealth of Virginia um, to take students after their two years to finish out. And I've had many excellent students go through even, you know, and continue on at the graduate level who started with their first two years um, and uh, at community college and really uh, it made the process much more affordable than it otherwise might. Mason's have. model with Nova is a national example to hold up. That if anyone's unfamiliar with it or interested in those transfer pathways, what George Mason is doing with Northern Virginia Community College is really exceptional. And and Mason is not only uh, on the, the you know community college to you know four year transition, but just the whole philosophy of Mason uh, is is is. Um, noteworthy, particularly when it's also uh, considered to be a prestigious university. So it's, it's got a lot of things going for it. Well, um, that's good news to hear. And I can also say, you know, when Casey brought up even location, 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 we do talk about that, you know, where you're going and costs. 
And um, not to do a commercial for Mason, but I guess that's how we're wrapping it out, <laughs> wrapping it up here. Um, but it, uh, our graduates are among the highest income earners of any graduates of uh, Virginia schools. So, and I think part of it is the region that we're in, we are in such proximity to such great employers. Uh, so that, that can be an advantage too when people are choosing location, wherever that might be nationally. Um, and there was one other question, and I think Claude, you addressed this, but just about the apprenticeship programs and how you see businesses working um, with educational students, uh, educational institutions rather, you know, to promote that type of partnership. And I think you spoke to that a little bit, but did you have anything more to add uh, in that sense about mm -hmm. what these apprenticeship programs might look like? Yeah, I'd say start early. There's a program we've got. Uh, I think Will brought it up in a prior discussion, PTEC. Uh, this is at the high school level, right? Someone's in the high school determining where they're going to develop skills and they can graduate with their high school diploma plus, uh, have earned a two-year degree, if you would, in uh, a particular specialty, and then develop from there. And one of the things that really matters is we talk a lot about STEM and the importance of technology. Uh, cybersecurity, we all read about it these days, people breaking into computer systems, hacking into the data. Uh, that's a tremendously valuable skill, but it's not a common four-year degree that's out there that you could pick up at any university. But I think if we start allowing people to develop early in high school through programs that are available, we can nurture folks into those paths if it's of interest to them. Uh, so it's, it's not, you know, and now that I'm done with high school, where do I go? I think we start as early as we can. We start encouraging as early as we can. And I think the other thing that uh, when one of the things I saw recently with regard to internships is just shadowing. And with uh, the, uh, you know, all these Zoom calls and everything, uh, there's the opportunity for uh, students at, you know, high school, college, whatever, just to literally just sit in on a Zoom call for a corporation and shadow uh, and listen to what's going on there. And I do want to give a, a lot of credit to Will on something he said earlier, which is schools have got to be held accountable. They got to be held accountable in terms of people that start in persistence and finish, and they do have to be held accountable in terms of uh, just outcomes. You know, the, um, uh, the programs that we had at the department, you know, gainful employment, uh, those were good ideas, but the only problem was is that they only applied to not-for-profit schools. Uh, for-profit schools, I mean, excuse me, they applied for, to for-profit schools, not to not-for-profit schools. And I can point to a number of not-for-profit schools that are highly egregious in terms of loading people up with debt and not having uh, meaningful programs. So uh, all schools have got to be held accountable. If, you, if you're entitled to receive Title IV funds, whether you're not for profit or for profit, you got to be held accountable. And the question is, who is holding them accountable? Well, and I'm pleased to say, as I see we're at time and we have to wrap up, but I think all of you who have joined the panel today are going to be meaningful contributors to the solutions that we devise in the years going forward. And I, I'm pleased to say also that I think our students uh, can be a meaningful part of those solutions. And that um, as the director of the Master of Public Policy program here at the Shore School, I can say that I think our students are well qualified um, to have the skills to know how to devise better solutions in government, right? How to diagnose public problems and how to prescribe solutions for them. So it's my hope that however funded that graduate education includes people who are thinking incisively about policy solutions in government, um, since that's such a, a, an important value that we share. Um, and also just on the note of um, thanking Stacy once again for her um, conceptualization of this panel. And speaking of apprenticeships, I have another panel, um, a board member from the uh, Gender and Policy Advisory Board, Jimena Hartsock. And her next venture is a startup on um, mentorships and apprenticeships. So we may reconvene for a further conversation on that topic um, sometime in the year ahead as she gets um, some VC capital for that <laughs> and uh, we start going forward. So I just wanna thank all of you so much for being with us today. To anybody who's questions, I see some of my great students uh, in the q and I didn't get to all the questions, but thanks so much to our students and other um, audience members for being here. Um, and this, this webinar will be available as a video. Uh, if you attended, we'll send out the link once it's up and available if you'd like to share it. And thank you once again for uh, all for joining.